As director of the Wallace Stegner Center, uh, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce our final keynote speaker for the 25th annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium on Food and the Environment. Uh, she will be speaking today about why we have hunger amidst plenty. Professor Jessica Fanzo is the Bloomberg Distinguished Associate Professor of Global Food and Agriculture Policy and Ethics at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the Nitsky School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. She also serves as director of the Hopkins Global Food and Ethics Program. Before coming to Hopkins, uh, Jessica held positions at Columbia University, the Earth Institute, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the World Food Program, Biodiversity International, and the Millennium Development Goal Center at the World Agri Agroforestry Center in Kenya. Her PhD is from the University of Arizona. She's eminently qualified to speak about food policy and we're very thankful to have uh, Jessica wrapping up our 25th annual symposium with her talk on why we have hunger amidst plenty. Thank you, Jessica, for joining us today. Great, well, thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to thank the Wallace Stegner Center and Bob and colleagues for inviting me to be here. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure at least to be online during these times of uh, the COVID crisis that we are all experiencing. I'm gonna be discussing with all of you the issue of hunger and obesity. You know, why, why do we have this paradox where some people get uh, too, too, uh, not enough food and then others are, are, are experiencing a situation where we're living in an obesogenic environment. So let me first, um, go a bit into where we are. Now, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the malnutrition burden. So right now we're experiencing um, a profound paradox. On your left is a family, the Abubakar family from Darfur, Sudan. They're living in a camp in Chad as the picture shows. And that is their food ration for the week. Very simple carbohydrates, a little bit of, of, of fruits, the wines in that picture, some water. And that food ration costs about a dollar a week. And the Bubakar family is obviously struggling to survive, struggling to meet their dietary and energy needs. On the right is the Revis family in North Carolina. And this is a very different type of weekly rationing of food. This costs the family about $300 a week. And you can see just the, the profound paradox of who gets what kinds of foods, um, the amount of those foods and the quality of those foods. And you could argue that on both sides, both families are experiencing poor quality diets. So when we look at the malnutrition burden in the world, it's pretty startling to see some statistics. About one in three people are malnourished in the world. And if we don't do anything and take action, one in two people will be malnourished by 2030. Hunger is still a, a significant issue. Hunger's been declining uh, up until about the last three years, where now we're seeing it increase again to about 121 million people. That's largely due to climate change and conflict and protracted crises. We also see um, a profound uh, issues with children, children uh, under the age of five who are stunted. There's about 150 million children stunted or chronically undernourished. Um, these children are impaired usually for life in their development trajectories. 50 million children are wasted or acutely malnourished, meaning they don't get enough food or uh, they're exposed to infectious disease burden. Um, and these children have a very high uh, mortality rate. 
and another 40 million children uh, under the age of five are overweight, which is really unheard of 30 years ago. And we see this significant rise in young children, school-age children, adolescents, and obesity. And 2.1 billion adults are overweight and obese. So this is a massive, complex malnutrition burden that in which every country faces at least one form of malnutrition. When we look just at the children who are under the age of five, children can be both stunted and wasted. And children can be stunted and overweight. And where we see most of that double burden of stunting and wasting and stunting and overweight sits in Asia and Africa. And this makes it incredibly complex to deal with when we see more than one form of malnutrition burden in one child, in an individual child. This is a very complex uh, situation uh, that leads to poor development and health into adulthood. Uh, this is a study that just came out by Barry Popkin and colleagues in the Lancet series showing that um, countries that are facing a double burden. So in, in this situation, it is countries that are facing undernutrition amongst children and overweight and obesity in adults. What this shows that over time, when we look at countries that are higher income from wealthier, so Q4, and the poor countries, Q1, we've seen a shift in this double burden in which wealthier countries, which used to have a double burden in the 1990s, no longer have that double burden in the, in the present day. And where we've seen this transformation or change are in the poor income countries. So in Q1 countries, we see they've shifted now to having a single burden to now double burdens. And we see that across when we look at double burdens accounting for 20% of the adult overweight population being uh, overweight, 30% or 40%. We're seeing this shift of double burden prevalence into low income countries, uh, which is, is, is quite a challenge for governments to have to tackle. So, so why do we have these double burdens? Why do we have hunger and undernutrition and obesity at the same time? So for the rest of, of my talk, I'm gonna, going to first talk about why do we even have hunger? You know, why do we have hunger when we have so much food being produced in the world, so much food being moved around the world? Why are people still dealing with hunger on a daily basis? How do we get to this place of having both hunger and obesity? And then what can we do about it? So first, why do we still have hunger? Well, one of the biggest drivers of hunger is poverty. And we still have a significant number of people living in poverty. And while the number of those living in extreme poverty, living on less than $1.90 or less than a dollar a day, it's been declining. Um, we still have a significant number who, who are dealing with, with poverty and you know, over a billion in the poverty. So this is a major driver. Uh, another driver is that rural places are being left behind, forgotten, disenfranchised, underinvested in. And because of that, we see a big disparity so um, this is showing you by region, millions of children over time from 1985 to 2010. This is uh, on the left is showing you the number of stunted children in urban places and the number of stunted children in rural places. You could argue that the urban stunted uh, prevalence has not really changed and rurals come down, but there's still a, a, a significant number of, of children in rural places that are stunted as compared to urban places. On the other side of the malnutrition burden, we see that obesity is rising and that 
rural places have almost caught up to urban places in the obesity prevalence. This is showing you body mass index by different regions with urban being in purple and green being rural. You see almost in all places in the regions of the world, rural has caught up with, with, with urban obesity and in some cases surpassing it in, in high income uh, as well as high income Asia Pacific. So rural places while being left behind often considered more poor, they are also dealing with this double burden of both undernutrition and overweight and obesity. The other issue is climate. We see that climate change is having a profound impact on food systems and food security. Um, not only are we seeing a depletion of natural resources over time with rising temperature changes and CO2 emissions, um, but we know that there, with climate uh, in a business as usual situation in which no action is taken to mitigate against climate change and disruption, we're going to probably see more people at risk of hunger. And this graph over here is showing you different scenarios, um, orange being the worst type of scenario, very business as usual scenario versus more positive future scenarios where we see uh, more environmental conservation and equity we still see a big significant risk of, of hunger as we move into the next three decades, and also uh, a decrease in dietary energy availability in this business as usual orange line approach. So with climate change, we're already seeing the effects of hunger, but if we stay on the same course as we are now with little action on climate, uh, hunger numbers will most likely go up as well as the inability to access dietary energy. And we'll also most likely see climate change impacting food prices. This is showing you uh, climate change trajectories. Uh, orange showing you the, the middle range climate change scenarios and blue showing you no climate change. And we'll see uh, price increases of the major crop commodities like maize, wheat, and rice over time. Um, and this puts uh, families, households, communities, countries um, in a very vulnerable, volatile situation with increased food prices. We see that in some places like Nigeria, Kenya, Kazakhstan, other places where they're already spending a significant proportion of their income on food with food price spikes, we'll see that, that, uh, that go up and putting these households at extreme vulnerability. And we know that with food price spikes and, and unexpected, unpredictable food price spikes, which what we saw in the blue line here is showing you in 20, uh, 2008, 2009, and again in 2010, 2011, these significant food price spikes, we saw an association of food-related protests and riots. So um, you know, as food prices go up, volatility goes up, conflict goes up, uh, people get very scared, very nervous, very uneasy about the ability to feed their families a lot of conflict countries. So how do we get to this place of paradox where we have hunger, talked about poverty, ruralism, climate change, food prices and conflict being uh, instigators of, of this prolonged issue of, of hunger, but we are also dealing with obesity. And when we look at the food systems, we look at people, we look at lifestyles, we are transitioning and transforming. And, and I'll walk us through some transformations that we're seeing. The first is that people and our communities and our, our world are changing. We have a significant urbanization, globalization, economic growth, and technological changes. And when we look at the patterns of change of people, 
Barry Popkin and Adam, Adam Drunowski termed something called the nutrition transition a long time ago, which really talks about how people change their nutritional status over time. And they have five patterns, and I'm only showing you three because the first two are really don't really exist anymore. Pattern three are um, communities who are rural, smallholder farmers, sub-Saharan Africa, with receding famines. These communities tend to go to bed hungry often, seasonally. They have low variety and diversity of foods, very labor intensive on farm jobs. And these are the communities that are still reeling from stunting, maternal and child health deficiencies, micronutrient deficiencies. As countries urbanize and people move away from rural places to urban places for jobs, we see a real change in the disease epidemiology and the nutrition status, as well as their diets. People consume more processed packaged foods, high in sugar, sodium, fat. They consume more street food. They shift in their, in their, in their physical activity. They do less labor intensive work. They don't walk, they, they get on public transportation. And this is where you see this obesity emerge and diet-related non-communicable diseases. The fifth pattern is an, a very educated urban uh, community, wealthier, tend to be able to eat healthy, purposefully exercise, um, are able to maintain body weight and have low disease risk. Most of the world sits in pattern four. About five billion or so of us sit in pattern four. About a billion people go hungry, that 821 million I talked about earlier. And then about a billion are the fortunate ones who are able to afford a healthy diet and afford to be able to, to live in green spaces, etc. But most of the world sits here this emergence of undernutrition into the overweight obesity, this double burden category. And this is the population that's shaping the global food system because there's just so many living in this transition space. So much of that transition is due to urbanization. We're gonna see significant urbanization over the next two decades, if not already, um, and declines in rural populations with Africa being the last to, to urbanize. Um, and of course, significant population pressure. We're going to go to 10, 11, 12 billion over the next decades, which will uh, put significant constraints on urban centers. One thing that we know when we, we look at you know, rural versus urban places, there's still a, an, what's been coined as the urban uh, bias. It was coined by Michael Lipton in the 1970s, talking about why people stay poor. And there's always been this urban bias in which um, urban investment has always been prioritized over rural development. And that's often due to lack of political voice, self-agency of the rural poor and a real emphasis on, on dealing with uh, urban growth and, and, and where the job markets are, which tends to be more urban. And this creates a lot of issues in leaving rural people behind. Uh, one of the things that is transforming food system. So while we transform, people move to urban places, our food systems are also transforming. Your food systems are meant to uh, feed us and feed us well, but they often are, are sacrificed for efficiency um, and, and not so much uh, worried about the environment, health, and equity that, that we need so badly for the food system to be able to deliver on. And let me just show you some examples of how our food is transforming. Uh, this is work done by Colin Curry and others at SEAT showing that looking at the food supply, the food being produced, uh, producing, uh, the food that's being produced in countries, you see that that food supply composition is homogenizing. This figure on the left shows you in the 1960s, the outer ring 
as you move more towards present day, the inner red ring, you see that countries' food supply composition has become uh, much less diverse. So the diets have become much more similar in that countries used to grow 30, 40, 50 types of foods. Most countries are growing around 10 to 12 crops, those being staple and oil crops. And if you look over time at the change, we've seen a really significant uh, rise in the production of soybeans, sunflower, and palm oil, and a reduction in some of these more what's called traditional crops like cassava, sweet potato, millets, and sorghum, those two crops being to Africa. We've seen a decline in some of these traditional crops and more uh, an uptick in, in, in oil, oil seed crops and the major uh, staple crops, maize, rice, wheat, and potatoes. So most of the food production system is became, becoming very homogenized, which puts the food system at significant risk from a diet diversity perspective, as well as a climate perspective. Our diets are changing too. This is showing you uh, diets uh, in grams per day. Um, across the globe in gray and sub-regions uh, in different colors. On the top are the first uh, five graphs showing you the components of a healthy diet, that being fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. On the bottom are the less healthy components, red meat, processed meats, that's the cured salted meats, sugar-sweetened beverages, trans fats, and sodium. And what you see overall, if you look at green being the amount to, to, to reach or the amount to limit to below, um, you'll see that most of the world is not consuming enough of the healthy foods, whereas most of the world is consuming way beyond sugar-sweetened beverages being almost zero here is the recommendation. You can see that most of the world is consuming way too much of the unhealthy stuff. And what has resulted in is that now dietary risks are the top risk factor of disease and death globally. And you really see this across different countries as well, dietary risks being the number one risk factor of disease. More than high blood pressure, tobacco, air pollution, which we're hearing a lot about in the context of climate, alcohol, Etc. we're seeing that dietary risks are, are the number one. Other uh, changes in diets have been happening. This is showing you change in um, sales per capita of certain foods. These are the ultra-processed foods and the ultra-processed drinks. And this is change um, in sales from 2002 to 2016. And these ultra-processed food and beverages are foods that are highly processed, packaged foods, high in sugar, salt, and unhealthy fats, or drinks like sugar-sweetened beverages, like soda. Um, and you really see in most regions of the world an increase in sales of these really um, unhealthy foods, with the exception of North America, interestingly, which has been coming down. But when you look at just sale volume, North, uh, North America, the United States, Canada, is, it blows everybody out of the water. We're consuming and buying a lot of these ultra processed foods, but the trend has been downward. But everywhere else in the world, we're seeing an upward trend in sales of these unhealthy foods. Another uh, transformation in the food system that we're seeing is the ways that we purchase and eat food. So for example, US grocery spending made online has been going up and will continue to rise. There's probably gonna be a big spike uh, right now in 2020 with the, the COVID. A lot of people are buying their food online through Uber Eats or, or home delivered groceries. But overall in the US, you can see that US groceries uh, being uh, made online, so people never walk into a grocery store, is rising significantly. Latin America, as an example, shows you that food consumed away from home, 
So on the go kind of foods has been rising exponentially. So this is showing you Latin America countries. Um, and interestingly, this is a graph showing you China of online food deliveries um, have been rising significantly. And this is not groceries, this is cooked food. So meals uh, ordered on a phone and delivered cooked and ready to eat. So it's not only that food is, uh, you know, Chinese are not, young, these, this is really young Chinese ages, 18 to 35 year olds. Not only are they not walking into a grocery store, they're not walking into their kitchen. So we're seeing a real transformation in the way people are purchasing, cooking, and eating food. And we're seeing a real decline in the ability for young people to know how to cook. And they watch more cooking than they actually do cooking, uh, ironically. Um, and I think with this whole COVID situation of a lot of people staying at home, it will be interesting to see how that plays out. Will people be cooking more? Will people just be ordering cooked food and having it delivered? It will be an interesting case study to see when people are homebound more, what they do, what they tend to do with their time when it comes time to food. The other big transformation that we see is that we're, we're really seeing consolidation and concentration of, within the food system. We've got about 1.5 billion producers, farmers in the world, and about 7.5 consumers. But along the value chain, as food is moved, it's processed, it's packaged, and it hits markets, we see a real concentration of who owns those, those steps in the value chain, with 10% of firms controlling tr uh, the trade, 10% controlling 90% of processing. So we're seeing this concentration and concentration of power in the food system, and that has really uh, changed over the last several years. And um, we also see a real shift when we think about food system transformations, about how uh, in, in countries that are dealing with undernutrition, significant undernutrition, like uh, in places in Sub-Saharan Africa, they see that the wealthier tend to be more overweight and the poor tend to be undernourished. But you start to see a shift like you do in the United States in which poor people tend to suffer more from obesity. And that's really hard to wrap your mind around of this idea of being poor, food insecure and obese. But this is the, the situation that most of the world moves into like what we're witnessing in the United States. And it's a complex relationship of being poor, food insecure, and obese. And a lot of it has to do with stress, anxiety, depression, cycles of deprivation, like some are dealing with right now with COVID, limited access to food and food stores, places to buy food, healthcare, fewer opportunities for physical activity. And, and greater exposure to marketing of obesity uh, promoting food products. So it's a very complex relationship, but it is a transformation that we're seeing in many parts of the world. Uh, one of the transformations you see is this inequity um, in some places where you live and you are it depends on your ability to access a healthy diet. And this is showing you a map of Seattle. And the green uh, is showing you the more expensive real estate obviously hugs the waterways um, in Seattle, with the red being the least expensive. The map on the right is showing you a healthy eating index, green being healthier. And it really shows you the, the, a mirror image of these maps and that residential property values, education and incomes are highly associated with the ability to eat healthy and the access to healthy foods and healthy diets. We also see um, a complex interaction between undernutrition over here on the left and overweight and obesity. 
and this is a kind of a nightmarish <laughs> figure, but there is a very strong relationship of being undernourished at, in, in early years, early childhood, and being at higher risk for obesity if you survive into adulthood. And there's a lot of linkages and relationships and mechanisms for that here in the middle with the nutrition transition I mentioned earlier being one of these mechanisms. But there is a relationship between being undernourished in, in youth and overweight in adulthood. So we cannot really think about these two malnutrition burdens and this transformation in separately. They need to be thought of together when we, we take actions on, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit. So what do we do about this really complex situation? Well, there's not one simple thing to do. There's no sil silver bullet. There's not one tool. It requires a lot of different approaches, strategies across many scales and across the entirety of the food system. We need fiscal measures, we need regulatory and trade measures and interventions. We need private sector food and beverage industries to step up. Um, and we need uh, interventions that, that, that deal with uh, consumers, the contexts of where they live, uh, the context of where people uh, access food and live their lives, and, and information and education. One of the first things we can do is push for countries to develop a food systems policy. No country has a, a systematic, systemic policy that addresses all of the places where food touches upon uh, most policies focus on agriculture, they focus on dietary guidelines, but they don't address the many different sectors that food touches upon, um, not only health and agriculture, but environment, culture, and education, for example. We need to increase funding for nutrition. This is showing you official development assistance, so countries that are giving assistance to other countries in need, um, showing you the agriculture uh, ODA dispersed over time. It's about 4% goes towards agriculture, whereas only 0.5% of the ODA goes to nutrition, and this specifically undernutrition even less goes towards overweight and obesity. And I had mentioned earlier that the malnutrition burden is massive. So this significant underinvestment in nutrition is really detrimental to countries that are reeling from this double burden of malnutrition and all of its complexity. So there's a real dearth of funding going towards nutrition, either coming from a government investing in its own population or an official development assistance coming from other countries. We need to reorient our ag systems. It wouldn't be that hard to do. Your subsidy policies really focus on the things that we're producing right now, like cereals and starches, some oils and fats, sugar, is the majority of the agriculture subsidy programs around the world. But this does not mirror the types of foods and diet that we should be eating, which should be rich in fruits and vegetables, nuts, oils, um, and other um, healthy components of a diet. So our agriculture subsidy policies and agriculture systems around the world are homogenized around just a few staple crops, sugars, and oils, which is not what is, is the healthiest diet to be consuming. So we really have this unmatched situation. We also need to be thinking about who's producing our food. Uh, I really like this quote by Ruth DeFries. Now we are transforming from farmers to urbanites. Our newest experiment to feed massive numbers of people from the work of a few is just beginning. The outcome is yet to be seen. If people are leaving rural places, and the average age of the world's farmer is 62, 
who is going to feed the 12 billion people that are moving into urban places? That is a big question that we don't know the answer to. And we need to start supporting those that are producing food and feeding us because they are often the most food insecure. We need to invest in smallholder farmers. They uh, still produce a significant amount of the nutrients in the food supply. The question is, why are they such big producers of all of our nutrients? Well, they have the most diverse farms. They haven't homogenized their food production systems. They're growing many diverse crops that are nutrient rich and they should be supported. They struggle to survive. They're often the most poor. Um, they're most vulnerable to climate. And this was work done by Mario Herrero showing that they produce between 53 and 81% of all the micronutrients in the food supply. And they still make up about 84% of all the farms in the world. They're just never invested in. So we need to be thinking about smallholder farmers and continuing to invest in, in, their, in their landscapes. We need to also maximize nutrition as food moves along the value chain. You know, I showed you earlier that the highly processed foods, the ultra processed foods, they have significant losses of nutrition as they move along the value chain. They get processed, packaged, nutrients are removed. We need to think about ways to inject nutrition as it moves along the value chain and ensure that nutrients are not lost. And there's so many interesting uh, case studies and evidence of how to do this. We just need to scale it up across value chains. Uh, seven, there, I have 10 points, seven, um, we need to engage and empower women. They are feeding families. They are still uh, the biggest uh, uh, voice in what is produced more and more. Women are the smallholder farmers of the world. Um, we know evidence shows that if you put income in the hands of a woman, the health and nutrition of her children and her house improves significantly as compared to men around the world. So we need to invest in women, give them social capital, give them access to credit and infrastructure and technology and tools to become entrepreneurs in the food system and invest in their own human capital, their health and education. They're so critically important to food systems functioning well. Number eight, we need to think about the food environment. This is the place where people walk into a market and they make a decision about what they're gonna buy and eat. There's so much happening to improve the health of food environments around the world. Chile is a great example. They instituted a front of the pack label, a warning sign for ultra processed foods. They took those foods, put a warning sign on them and then regulated those foods. It cannot be advertised to children in schools or near schools or sold to children. And what they saw with this warning label, they found that, this is a study that just came out, overall, once Chile put that warning label on, they had a 23% reduction in the sales of those foods. That's significant. And if you compare that to Mexico's sugar uh, soda tax, so the soda tax in Mexico has been about a 7.6% reduction in purchases of the soda. So, so maybe adding not only a tax, but a label limiting advertising can have a pretty significant effect as compared to a soda tax. So providing the education and then regulating that food. And we need to take on these double duty actions to address the double burden of malnutrition. And this goes back earlier to what I was talking about, the linkages between undernutrition and overweight and obesity. They should not be seen separately, they should be seen together. And there's many actions that can be taken to address both burdens. And this was work done by Corinna Hawks and Marie Ruel and others, a uh, paper that just came out outlining what those double duty actions look like. One being breastfeeding, a very important intervention 
that can protect you early into later life. And last, we need to think about the underlying determinants. We can think about addressing diets and food environments, but people live their lives uh, outside of a food system. You know, they're dealing with many different issues. Uh, this is a picture showing you Baltimore, where Johns Hopkins is, and this is uh, Timor-Leste, a place where I work uh, a lot. And both communities are dealing with lots of complex societal issues. Of poverty, of violence, conflict, drug and alcohol abuse, food insecurity, and health disparities. And we need to consider these social determinants when we're, we're thinking about taking action and, and, and ensuring that governments um, play a big role in that. So in summary, we can't leave everything to the individual. We need, um, we need governments to step up. We can't also leave it to just private sector to do the right thing in the food system. Um, they're important, but their efforts alone are not enough. We really need governments to govern. We need food system policies. Um, we need regulation. Um, we need them to help consumers uh, make the right decisions around their diets by providing healthy food environments and green spaces in, in urban places and for them to not forget about their rural people. And there's many actions that can be taken. They need to not only focus on one thing, but span many different parts of the food system and, and take on a whole food system approach if we really want to address um, the issues of both hunger and obesity. And I'll end there. Thank you. And Jessica, let me uh, thank you uh, once again for both this uh, concluding uh, keynote lecture for the 25th annual Wallace Stegner Symposium on Food and the Environment, but also uh, for your uh, Wallace Stegner lecture uh, that we heard uh, earlier this week. Uh, both of these uh, uh, presentations will be available uh, online and uh, will be available to uh, our uh, audience. And it's been a real pleasure to uh, have you uh, and to hear and draw from uh, your extraordinary expertise and experience in uh, the area of uh, food uh, policy, uh, both at the uh, domestic and the international level. <clears throat> With that, uh, let me uh, thank uh, those uh, who join us and check into these presentations remotely. Uh, over the next uh, few weeks and months, uh, we regret that we were not able to bring the Wallace Stegner Center Symposium this year uh, to you uh, live uh, or alternatively uh, live uh, on air, uh, but uh, we certainly hope that this collection of presentations uh, captures the essence of this issue of food and the environment. Uh, we uh, also uh, would like to thank once again uh, our principal funders and sponsors for their support of the Stegner Center Symposium and the Wallace Stegner Lecture. Principal funding uh, for uh, this year's uh, symposium and related events from the R. Harold Burton Foundation, which has been a founding donor of the Wallace Stegner Symposium for the last 25 years, and we are greatly uh, indebted to the Burton Foundation. Likewise, we are indebted to the Cultural Vision Fund, which provides support not only for the symposium, but also for a variety of other uh, Wallace Stegner Center events throughout the year, including the Young Scholar Program and our lecture series. Sponsors uh, for uh, this year's Stegner Center Symposium included the S.J. and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, the Nature Conservancy in Utah, and the student-run Natural Resources Law Forum here at the University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law. Uh, as uh, the director uh, of the Wallace Stegner Center, uh, I'm Bob Keiter, and I greatly appreciate uh, everyone uh, for uh, their, both their participation uh, and for, uh, uh, in the symposium and those uh, who will be joining us uh, here. 
Uh, we certainly hope that next year for the 26th annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium that we'll be able to join you live. With that, uh, we'll conclude uh, the online presentations. Thank you very much.